Hello, and after the dramatic music, you are now here at Varm Blog. Um, today, I'm with a panel consisting of members of the Marxist Unity Group, a caucus in the DSA, um, and we're going to be discussing uh, the um, attempt to redefine the DSA or to refine the DSA or maybe just move the DSA in the direction you guys already think it was going. I'm going to let you pick which one of those things you think is the actual truth. I'm not in DSA, so I can't speak to that. Um, I'm going to start with each of you introducing yourselves, how you got involved with the DSA, how you got involved in the Marxist Unity Group, and what you currently do in both organization and sub-organization, I guess it's a sub-organization. We'll figure that out as we talk and we'll start going clockwise. Yeah, thanks so much, Derek. I appreciate you having us on. My name's uh, Luke Pickerel. And how did I get into the DSA? Well, I had been in the ISO for a few years and the ISO fell apart. Um, and uh, I had been listening to podcasts and I'd been reading a little bit of Cosmonaut Magazine and then I was one of the few folks, I don't actually know how often it happens these days, where you know I had been in the ISO and had mostly just heard the DSA be kind of poo-pooed and, and, and dragged. And um, I thought, well, huh, you know, I really like the Cosmonaut folks. It's interesting that they're getting involved in the political project. Uh, so I'll join the DSA as a means to getting involved in this thing called MUG. Uh, so the two kind of happened simultaneously. That was back in oh, I suppose very late 2021, very early 2022. Um, I've gotten more involved in, in MUG as, as time's gone by. Um, I now support us with doing our recruitment and onboarding. So we try and bring in more folks into the group. And to do that, we have a reading group. Uh, we now have interviews. Uh, we try and facilitate discussion and do outreach with folks. Uh, so I support that side of things. Within DSA, um, I'm on the National Political Education Committee. Uh, this is my first time doing that. So that's a smaller group of folks uh, who discuss DSA's curriculum, education projects, the events and speakers that we have on and so forth. Yeah, so that's a little bit about me. The Education Committee is one of the few DSA groups that I've actually worked with in a semi-formal capacity because I've been asked to do so many educational uh lectures and whatnot at various DSA chapters. So um, it's just always kind of funny because I'm not a member. Um, going to the next person. We'll skip to Tony while we, uh, Aaliyah gets, uh, oh, okay. oh well, Aaliyah's back. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, my name is Aaliyah Van Pelt. Um, I live in South Dakota and I got involved with MUG. Really, I mean, for me, um, I, because of where I live in South Dakota, there is basically no existing uh, organizations or like political infrastructure for socialists or communists whatsoever. Um, I've been, I helped start and was involved with like a mutual aid group for a few years out of Sioux Falls. Um, but I really kind of spent a lot of time online, you know, and just reading books, trying to educate myself about Marxism. Um, and I came across Marxist Unity Group um, through just meeting some of their members actually and talking to them about politics and history and theory. And um, at that time, I was a CPUSA member actually, but there's, I just, it amounted to a total lack of real engagement. Um, there were no meetings, nothing for me to really plug into, no projects. I kind of felt like I was just floating around. And I saw the MUG project and I, I just was in for it just immediately. I loved the platform. I loved the, you know, concise, clear direction um, and plan of action. And I just knew I wanted to get involved. So I actually uh, joined the DSA 
two joined mugs, uh, similarly to Luke. Um, and I don't think we're the only mug members um, that have done so. And yeah, I'm really glad I made that choice. Um, I became a member in February after doing the reading group and I'm on the recruitment committee as well now. Um, I'm actually helping Luke and our comrade Gil facilitate this reading group. Um, it's been really fun and exciting and yeah, I'm happy to be here. So thanks for having us. Oh, Tony. sorry. Um, I also am uh, kind of helping to spearhead an effort to get a DSA presence going in South Dakota. We have an organizing committee out of Sioux Falls and we're just kind of trying to expand those efforts, grow our membership um, and get involved in you know, existing projects. So it's an uphill battle <laughs> for sure, um, but it's exciting to be a part of. So that's what I'm up to. Awesome. Tony. Hi, um, my name's Tony. <clears throat> If I could just respond, it's really exciting, Aaliyah. I didn't know that you were um, planning to have a chapter in South Dakota. That's really promising news. Uh, but anyway, um, so how did I get involved in DSA? Um, I had some friends from college who were like doing electoral canvassing and they convinced me it was a good idea. And then I tried it and um, ended up doing a lot of that. And, uh, and then like three, three or four months into the campaign, I was like, well, I might as well pay for a membership because I'm like giving so much anyway. And so that's, yep, never look back, love the DSA. Um, <clears throat> and then it was that same group of electoral canvassers. There was one person who liked theory talking about like ideas and stuff. And um, that person sort of convinced me that Mug was um, my home. And I sort of do feel at home. So um, f as for what I do um, in Mug, I do like odd jobs. I don't have, I'm not really any, okay, so I do onboarding stuff. Like I helped with the interviews and sometimes I attend the groups but really in an auxiliary capacity. <laughs> um, and I also sort of am involved with treasurer activities because, well, I'm the treasurer for my small, modest chapter in New Jersey, Central Jersey. Uh, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Um... Long-time listeners of the show will know that I've had a Marxist group, Unity group member on before. That is Parker uh, McQueenie. McQueen, McQueenie. Um, Parker. I usually know him as Parker. Um, and we debated the 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 entering of the DSA, um, which is actually a long debate between me and... Uh, Cosmonaut Magazine co-founder Donald Parkinson that's gone back now for about eight years. Um, so what I find interesting and why you guys are here is that Marxist Unity Group, when I first encountered you as a formal organization and not just a bunch of people who like Cosmonaut Magazine, um, was probably in 2019 um, before I was doing the independent show. And I don't know formally when the organization as a caucus began to exist. I know that there has been some kind of organization uh, tied to um, tied to Cosmonaut Magazine going back all the way to 2015, 2016. Um, and originally even flirted with joining another group called the Marxist Center, which RIP. Um, so there is a longer history there, but one of the things that really impressed me about Marxist Unity Group and surprised me and indicated that there was a shift in the DSA itself, at least in what 
the left wing of the DSA was oriented itself to is when I was talking to Parker at the last um, convention, I think right after 2020 or going into 2021, um, the Marxist Union group was less than 60 people, you know, um, between one convention and another that has clearly radically shifted. Um, I'm not going to ask you your numbers because you may or may not want to let that be known, but it's much larger than 60 people. So how do you think this caucus gained so much momentum? Well, I will uh, cut in and say that um, we haven't quite breached 100 yet. Um, but I think that we kind of just really punch above our weight. Um, and I think that um, it's less of like this huge explosion in growth for MUG and more of our commitment to agitation around our platform that's popularized the ideas that we are talking about in the broader DSA. Um, so, you know, we also have a lot of, you know, sympathizers and such that aren't official members. Um, but, um, yeah, I think Luke's been around a little bit longer. Can you speak more to that growth as well? Yeah, I can speak a little bit to it. And one thing I guess I'm drawing on, you know, having done the reading groups several times now and now having done a little bit of interviews, I get to hear a little bit about, you know, why folks applied and what excited them and, you know, what drew them to MUG and so forth. And I think it's a few things. Um, it can range from folks being on Twitter and seeing a very, you know, insightful Twitter post or following someone and seeing, you know, good takes, good political analysis. Uh, it can be that folks really vibe with our points of unity and appreciate it that there is a points of unity document and a, you know, a perspectives document. I think folks appreciate having um, a, a plan, a goal, some direction, uh, clear politics, but then clear politics that are, that are out there, uh, that's easy to find. Um, I think folks appreciate our theoretical rigor. Um, you know, I suppose there's a little bit of the quip online perhaps, so, you know, reading groups and this, that, and the other. Um, but I really do think people appreciate uh, rigorous study uh, and good analysis uh, and critical thinking and, and curiosity. Um, and those are all things that I think, you know, I've certainly seen in MUG. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think maybe framing it even less as like the growth of MUG and more like the empowerment and uplifting and expansion of the left wing of the DSA broadly um, and the sort of partyist movement broadly within the DSA, I think has been, you know, a huge shift and kind of contributes to that general vibe change. <laughs> um, so as an outsider um, who follows uh, socialist and communist politics very closely and has now for 15 years or so. Um, one thing I can say that I've been interested in is, well, for one, all the caucuses punch a bug their way. Like when you actually get people to admit their numbers, which they rarely do. So props on you for that. Um, it's usually between like 150 and 250 people in an organization of, of uh, oh, between 70 and 80,000, um, roughly. One of the things that that leads to and is interesting to me is that means all these caucuses must be must have appeal outside of their membership, even when you're looking in terms of the national convention, because otherwise, why would they be there? One of the things that we've also seen in the DSA, though, is caucuses come into being and fall apart relatively quickly. I went through the the list of caucuses um from 2019 2020 2021 and 2022 and i was actually like well that one's gone and that one's turned into that one and this one's over here and these two merged and like um one of the things i think is interesting about that and 
I think we're going to have to get into the nature of caucuses in the DSA because one of the things that's very strange to me about them is they don't all do the same thing. They don't all, it's like what they're organizing around varies greatly. Um, but I remember it was 2018 and I was asked by the New Orleans um, DSA to come and speak on programmatism, the history of uh, political programs and, um, you know, what would happen if a program was adopted. In addition to, be heckle to being heckled by an ISO member, um, uh, the, the other thing that came out of that that I think was actually quite interesting was that about half, even in uh, 2018, even before the second Bernie campaign, about half of the people there really wanted the DSA to start talking about what it would look like to form a um, political program for a variety of reasons. Some things that came up was like figuring out how to do internationalism once that now that they left the socialist international for good reason, I may add, in my personal opinion, even as an outsider. But what would internationalism look like now that they're not in the socialist international? Um, well, that requires a program. And then immediately the counter response was that a program would immediately split the DSA. Like any attempt to impose a program would immediately split the DSA. That attitude seems to have become a minority position within the DSA, but I still, I don't know that I, I say seems based off informal polls of chapters that I have connections to, watching Twitter, etc. Because one thing that we can see now between, say, the partyist faction and the campaignist faction, which I tend to call the right and the left, but some people get mad at me for doing that. So I'll be nice and call it the campaignist and the partyist. Um, is both of them are becoming more and more programmatic. They may disagree even within themselves and their coalitions or caucuses that make up those two orientations, what the program should be. But there is, even amongst the more labor bureaucracy, Democrat, uh, Democratic Party reformist end of the campaignist end of the, of the DSA caucuses, there is a lot more focus on there being an actual program of action. Um, from, from your standpoint in MUG, why do you think that's happening? It's open to anybody. I can speak to it for a little bit. Um, I think that folks like to know that there's a sense of direction in the activity that they do, uh, that they do the things that they're doing uh, for a particular end goal. Um, me personally, I like to know that I'm doing things for a particular goal that's a little bit more concrete than just socialism or realizing socialism or doing the revolution. Um, you get that a lot on the left. Uh, goodness knows it would come up sometimes in the ISO. Um, so on the one hand, when folks expend a lot of energy or they're very active, I think it's only natural that they want to feel like there's some large plan, uh, something they're working towards. Um, I'd like to think that folks are also looking for more specificity, um, and a more kind of detailed analysis about how this country works, uh, what change would look like what socialism would mean, what democracy would mean, stuff like that. I think people want detail and concreteness. Um, yeah, I think I'll pause. I think I'll pause at those two. I think, I mean, it's hard to say. I don't, I don't think you could put it on any one, you know, particular catalyst, but I would say probably the adoption of an actual platform in uh, 2019 um, was, you know, a really probably big part of that. A program and a platform do not have the same function, but I do think that they maybe have like a parallel function and that they provide coherence. And I think that as DSA, you know, agreed to cohere around a platform, 
there is more general cohesion. And I think the atmosphere has just been politicized. <laughs> um, and, you know, that does just lead into questions of program, I think, you know, naturally, because of the other questions you're asking yourself around this platform. So I think that that probably at least contributed to it as well. And if I could jump in real quick, you know, I think accountability is something that people are thinking about a lot these days. I'm sure it'll come up, perhaps it'll come up in our discussion. Um, but of course, it begs the question, well, if you're going to hold people accountable, you know, what the heck are you going to hold them accountable to? What are our ideas? You know, what does DSA even stand for? Um, so you need something that lays out you know, what you stand for and, you know, that draws certain lines, certain distinctions. Um, so, you know, while I'd actually be curious to talk more with people about that, I would have to think that something around this idea of accountability, you know, might have something to do with it. Yeah, because I think once you do make those delineations, you know, you deliberate and you come to those conclusions together um, about a platform, you know, principles and, you know, the kind of ideals you're upholding and what you want to see happen, you know, you do have to then go back and ask those questions. Okay, how do we do that? <laughs> um, so it just seems like a natural product is this kind of, you know, questions about platform and, you know, actual action. One thing the last convention actually clarified in many ways was where the DSA was going after its boom growth in 2020 and then actually kind of significant retreat in 2021 in terms of its membership numbers. One of the things that was unclear was what direction was it headed? It seemed for a long time, particularly in terms of accountability, and I like that Luke brought that up because that's going to be a major theme in my questions today as well, that um, the platform of 2019 was adhered to as, as much in breach by, by key factions related to the NPC and maybe the NPC itself as it was actually something binding. And then relationships to, quote, elected, a term I hate, by the way, I just find it gross um not because i'm against elections uh it's it i think sometimes the the claims there the dsa's uh trying to hit above its weight and then and then however can't do anything about accountability in regards to these elected so its weight becomes very it shows a weakness pretty quickly when you do that um and one thing that I just couldn't tell from the outside, and I couldn't tell from my local chapter because my local chapter is very particular, um, even though it's large, uh, is where the trends in the DSA were actually going. Was it going more into the campaignist route? Were we going to double down on the squad, uh, on... Uh, what I unfairly call the Ryan Grimm and Jacobin sections of the DSA, and I totally admit that that's unfair, but um, or was the DSA going to try to forge in a new direction now that it seemed like its weakness in that capacity had been shown? And that was largely going to be decided by who was staying in the organization. Like, that's going to make the decision. Like, And so a lot of us on the outside were actually expecting the opposite results this convention i'm not gonna lie we were expecting the campaigners to basically dominate and some of the early convention platform votes which i will admit it was actually hard for me to pick up trends in the platform votes when i was looking at them because i was like everything won kind of except for the things that i really really wanted but um that it might still go that way. And then when we saw the MPC results, we were like, whoa, Marxist Unity Group, Commander Nowhere, has two members on the MPC. Uh, there are uh, Red Star, which 
is a formation that I'm not entirely familiar with. That seems to be a relatively new formation. I've been told it has something to do with refoundation, uh, the the defunct um, caucus. But nonetheless, I, you know, that's all rumor. I'm not in the organization. I don't know. Uh, also had many seats. You had a couple of um, issue caucuses, such as the BDS Alliance stuff and the, um, well, and an independent actor out of Portland who seems to be generally aligned with the, par with the partyist wing. And then it also seemed like there is an internal division within Bread and Roses, which is one of the larger caucuses, about shifting more towards the party of orientation, um, slightly away from its prior. And again, correct me if I'm wrong because I'm an outsider, but it always seemed to me that like uh, Bread and Roses was a was a weird hybrid formation of like ex ISO people and then Jacobin people, and I never really understood how they got along in the first place, but. Um, the nonetheless, it being one of the larger, quote, semi partyist caucuses, that it was now leaning in a more partyist direction. Um, is that is that your understanding internally? Uh, are, are we misunderstanding things from the outside? And what do you think led to that scenario? Well, I'd say that's, you know, probably a pretty fair appraisal of Bread and Roses um, to start. I've heard them called the big tent within the big tent. And I think that that is kind of true of their character. Um, I think they, they can be a bit of a catch all. Um, but yeah, I do think, you know, there is division. I think there's, you know, especially among the left caucuses, there's, you know, division in all the caucuses. There's division in MUG. Um, I'd, I'm not against using left right framing any party and any faction is going to have like a, you know, a left and a right to it that you can delineate. It's not a perfect science. It's also okay to use that terminology. Um, I think we need to get away from like the fetishization of like, like this, just anything that's as uber left as possible is what is good and right. Like that's very silly. It's not good analysis. Um, yeah. I second that. Um, I think, most of our internal understanding is just in terms of right and left. Um, and I think it's just the natural, that's the way politics works. Any group of people, even if they're on the left, it's going to, it's going to make sense what right and left means, but it'll always take a concrete analysis of the political situation. Like, uh, like in McNair's revolutionary strategy, you know, he, there's, he does like a lot of historical, research but he's very clear like this is what right means this is what center means this is what left means and that doesn't really mean that it'll always mean the same thing in the same situation but um i feel like the the way we think internally is like that's the natural framing of political disagreements kind of like i mean i would say that partyist is a really good characterization of the left wing of DSA. We want like independent party, but campaign is gives me a little bit of um, trepidation because like as a leftist DSA member, I'm very much in favor of campaigns. It's just that I want the goals of the campaigns are a little bit different, right? So I can say yes to campaigns and partyist. And so, um, I think this, which, which campaigns are we, is, is, is characteristic. There is a certain type of campaign that characterizes the right wing of the DSA, which is like, what do you guys think it is? Like try to as, elect as many people as possible. Like, I don't know. I'll, I'll kick it back over to you to characterize that. But like, I think, I mean, there's so much to respond to here. For one, um, I think that internally within mug, we also would kind of like going back to what you said, we kind of characterize like the right and the left around these terms of kind of like debate and polemic and just real like politicization. I think, you know, the right of the DSA, I think the concern is this kind of like relax into just bureaucracy and NGOification, um, running elected, you know, trying to just win as many spots as we can. Um, 
you know, so it's it's less about, you know, do we or do we not engage in electoralism? But I think the unique thing about Mug specifically and especially um, among other things is uh, how we polemicize about um, electoral campaigns and like the intention behind them, how we structure them, you know, accountability, um, the kinds that are worth running, the kinds that aren't. Um, I think that we focus in on electoral politics in a very different way than the other caucuses and in, I believe, a productive way. Um, you know, it kind of, you know, within the party a structure, we are kind of classified among the dirty breakers. Um, but I think for us, you know, it's really about like, you know, building that that base um, and um, for like real socialist electoralism, actually holding people accountable to the platform, not just running any Democrat that, you know, is like, I'm a progressive and blah, 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 you know. Um, I think we just take, uh, I don't know, we think that electoral campaigns should have a specific character. Um, and so that's one thing that's unique about us. Yeah, I think that is the key issue that characterizes the divide is the nature of electoral politics. And to address your question before about like what caused that shift, I think we just have good answers to these questions that convince people and we prioritize doing it in a comradely way with like as little personal attacks as possible and try to just just like bernie sanders you know like bernie sanders always going to talk about medicare and whatever he has his talking points he doesn't he doesn't get caught up in other bullshit <laughs> he's got an agenda and I think that strategy is really effective for internal DSA politics as well. <clears throat> I think it's also like, how do we define like a comradely relationship? Because I think one of the things that characterizes the DSA right is this idea that like, you know, we can all agree on these few things, so we should just stick to those things and let's not argue and like, that's scary. And, you know, we don't want to like get into those difficult questions. And I think like, you know, for us, we would understand a comradely relationship is like having those debates and having them out in the open and bringing other people in and really facilitating a political environment um, where, you know, people are able to express, you know, their opinions and their ideas um, and then hash them out with each other. Um, and I think that that is maybe more comradely in nature because it comes with an understanding just basically that everyone is capable of hearing these ideas, you know, coming to rational and effective and productive conclusions together. Um, and we, you know, are really trying to push, push that forward. And I think that's one of the great things about DSA is, you know, its infrastructure is democratic in nature. So we're able to do that, you know, in, in a way that is less of, I think, an uphill battle than it maybe would be in other organizations. If I can just jump in real quick, you know, was the DSA trending in a partyist organization direction? Uh, was that idea bound to gain some uh, some legitimacy, some relevance, if in fact it is? Maybe, um, you know, for as long as I've been around the left, you know, the party and, and the need for a party is the perennial question. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, someone's going to say it, someone's going to talk about it. You're never going to escape it, you know, here in the United States, at least, uh, you know, even the ISO that said, you know, it's not a party. Well, you know, we're kind of working to build the next party or X, Y, and Z. So the question's going to be there. You know, I hesitate to say that it would almost be inevitable that it would, you know, get taken up somewhere within the DSA. Um, I will say though that, you know, there are a lot of things that make MUG unique, um, but being a partyist organization is, is not one of them. You know, there are other factions within the DSA that are partyist that want to see some political independence from, um, you know, from the Democratic Party that want to see us, you know, develop our own political candidates or members, so on and so forth. Um, what makes MUG unique is the demand to fight the Constitution and demand a new republic. 
Um, and that idea has not won out in the DSA. Um, there might be some growth uh, within the partyist wing. You know, folks want political independence. Um, but we're pretty clear that we form political independence on the basis of opposition to the Constitution and that demand for a democratic republic. And that's not how other caucuses see it. Even other folks who agree that we need political independence uh, from the existing uh, electoral parties. Um, so there is there is that element, and I and I wouldn't want that to get you know kind of lost. I think that's crucial. And just as like a quick last point, I. I think Luke is absolutely correct in saying, yes, these ideas have not won out for the whole of DSA. However, I do think that we have a really exciting glimmer of hope for Monk's politics, especially in our anti-constitutionalism and our agitation around the formation of a new republic, is the results that we've got at YDSA convention. We, I feel like YDSA in general is embracing these ideas more substantially and uh, more quickly than the whole of the DSA. Not to say that, you know, all of why DSA is just, you know, gung-ho anti-constitutionalist, but um, I do think among like, you know, the younger, the, like the youth wing of the DSA, um, these ideas are more popular and they're, there's been quicker headway, I think. Hmm. So there's a couple of things for me to parse out to you there. And maybe I'm going to explain my framework for, for this one. Um, I am highly influenced by Mike McNair as well, but I will say there's also a spectrum of people influenced by Mike McNair because everyone from Bosch Garson Kara to uh, Donald Parkinson has claimed to be influenced by revolutionary strategy. Um, which uh, it's a pretty crucial book. So my spectrum is as follows. <laughs> um, there, is, there is a broad spectrum, socialist, communist, right and left, of which the DSA is the center right. The left of the DSA for me is the center of the communist movement, um, which I think would be both on certain left communist forms and with certain say campaigners would probably make people uncomfortable. Um, within the DSA, it's actually hard to categorize the different factions cleanly, even on that spectrum as right and left. So I'll talk about that for a second. And maybe this will give us time to like characterize the factions, right? There's socialist majority, which I pretty clearly think is campaignist and right wing. And I agree campaignist is unideal. Maybe let's say accommodationist. I don't know. We'll come up with better words um uh we like to call them liquidationists <laughs> i'll let you use the 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 uh the nomenclature that i would probably use in private um so actually i would probably say worse than that but nonetheless there's socialist majority there is a newish faction that's also emerged in that milieu that I, I'm that I wasn't familiar with until this year. Can you speak to them a little bit? Like, who are the other people on the MPC? What are these factions, and how do we represent them? And then we'll talk about the the factions, and because there are factions that we need to talk about that aren't represented on the um, on the MPC. So let's start with the MPC factions. There's you guys, and we're gonna be talking about you guys for another hour. So we'll come back to that. Um, there is Red Star. What is your understanding of them as comrades? Well, I'll start by saying Red Star worked really closely with us at convention, actually. Um, they were kind of part of this broader leftist coalition that kind of emerged out of our agenda debacle, which I think honestly ended up characterizing the whole of convention. You know, I talked about earlier about how you know, the left and right are kind of delineated around, you know, questions of politicization. And, um, you know, the left coalition that kind of emerged, emerged around the necessity to put a new agenda together. 
and to get it passed <laughs> so that we could actually have a real um, agenda. And uh, Red Star was uh, crucial in making that happen um, along with some other caucuses. Um, and yeah, it's they're definitely on uh, the left of the DSA. Um, what are their goals from your perspective? And again, I'm not asking you from them. I will, if I can, I will get them to represent themselves eventually. But what are, what are their goals from your perspective, having worked closely with them at convention? Uh, okay, I'll jump in and say I don't really know. <laughs> okay, got it. That's fair. <laughs> um, I yeah, I don't have I don't have the the finest awareness of these things, but my sense is that they're mostly on board with our immediate mm, plans in terms of um, electoral campaigns and partyist organization. Um, I don't really know much beyond that, other than, yeah, that they're one of our closest allies. Yeah, but well, they <laughs> haven't explicitly signed on to the overthrow of the Constitution plank. <laughs> no, not many people do, as Luke and Aaliyah have said. But um, yeah, we, I mean, for example, we work together with them on the MPC. There's there's actually a, an initiative to start making the NTC meetings more accessible and have like guides to what's going on. And MUG is coordinating with Red Star on those sort of efforts. So we're basically just on the same team. And I haven't really spent the time to look at their platform in so far as it differs from ours. Maybe someone else can speak to that. <clears throat> um, I would say that they're probably like a bit further um, to the left than us, maybe. Um, I would, I'd say one of the big uh, distinguishing factors is that they would, they would be in what we're kind of loosely categorizing as like the clean break category, where they just kind of want um, an immediate, um, immediate severance from basically all associations with the Democratic Party. Where I think um, for us, it's it's not that we don't want that, um, but that you know, it's kind of more uh, long like trying to like look a little further out, um, maybe be a little more strategic and that like we're not ready to do that. And we need to actually like build the infrastructure to be able to do that and run our own independent candidates. Um, and so um, that is one distinction that I would be comfortable drawing. Okay. Uh, also just to let you know my bias, I am a clean breaker. If And when the DSA does it, I will join. But um, the... But but I think this is interesting because one of the things that you guys said earlier is you're listed as amongst the dirty breakers. But I totally don't think of you as dirty breakers. I don't think of you as signing on to the Ackerman plan at all. Um, I, I actually consider that like the the partiest end of the bread and roses kind of orientation. Um, and the way you just described it actually gives me a way to reconceptualize the problem because I was like, I don't know what I would call you guys. So what I might call y'all is long clean breakers as opposed to immediate clean breakers. So yeah, it wasn't us that came up with the clean slash dirty break terminology. It's just kind of been the working terminology for DSA members broadly and understanding the caucuses. I think that you're right. Um, I you know we do want this break. Um, and I think for us, um, you know, it's more just like, you know, getting away from like sloganeering and trying to think about, you know, what's going to be really effective. There are some members who would say, you know, let's run socialist Republicans, let's run socialist Democrats, we can like get them out there, um, where they're, you know, of course, other members that say, you know, we need to stop running, you know, any candidates uh, that, you know, aren't, you know, running like independently. Um, so there, even within MUG, I think there are differentiations in how to like um, actually uh, practice our platform. Okay. Well, yeah. Sure. That you know there was a short uh, little back and forth, maybe too short to call it a back and forth. But um, Parker, you know who you mentioned, Parker had published an article. I want to say originally in the Weekly Worker, kind of putting forward um, MUG's position in terms of electoral politics, accountability. Um, some folks in uh, 
Red Labor, another caucus in the DSA, then wrote a response to that. That got published on Cosmonaut. Uh, Parker then, you know, published a letter. Um, that was an interesting and informative article because, you know, it, it, it labeled Mug as, um, you know, one of these clear, you know, one of these clear delineations, one of, you know, as, as having one of these clear tactics. And at least for me, it allows me to kind of step back a little bit and think, huh, you know, what do these things really mean? What are we kind of getting at here beyond just, you know, attaching a particular term to, you know, a particular caucus? Um, so when folks ask that question to me, you know, clean, dirty break, you know, I tend to emphasize that forming your own political party, breaking from the Democratic Party, wouldn't inherently solve many of the problems that we're concerned about. Uh, so when we're talking about accountability, uh, when we're talking about, you know, opposition to, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the Constitution and various other elements of the state, um, you know, being separate from the Democratic Party doesn't really do all the hard work for you. Um, and so that's what we're, that's what we're trying to get at, right? You know, there, there's, it, it's harder than that. It would, it would, and <laughs> well, I guess, you know, forming an independent party would be very hard, but it would only be so easy if once we did that, we emerged as kind of a pristine, uh, you know, politically concise, you know, programmatically united, uh, you know, disciplines, so on and so forth. We emerged as this, you know, as this thing. Um, so I, th I think that's also what we're trying to get at. There's more, there's more to it, if you will. So going back through the NPC caucuses, we already spoke about Bread and Roses, which is, uh, I also agree, they're kind of the big tent within the big tent, but they're vaguely uh, party and pencil aligned. The Ackerman plan and the idea that Dirty Break kind of comes out of them in the first place from my understanding, or at least people now associated with them. Um, then we move, we've talked about uh, socialist majority. There is one new faction on the accommodationist slash liquidationist side that I was not familiar with. And then we can talk about the non NPC factions. Can we speak to that? Because um, they do have at least what three two three members on the npc um, are you talking about groundwork yes thank you because it was two different caucuses that became one and i forget what they were groundwork so what do we understand groundwork to be doing groundwork is actually not a caucus it was just a slate mm -hmm. of electors with common platform but no no further political association but um they seem like kind of like Green New Deal. Um, SMC sort of that end of the spectrum. That's my perception, at least. So I'm going to throw a question at you guys that I that I've been toying with for a long time, but that you don't know about. Um, one of the things that I have noticed about the nature of chapters in the DSA is that there are probably more center to left leaning chapters, according to the spectrum that we're laying out here, than there are right leaning chapters. But the right leaning chapters tend to be in areas of longstanding DSA power, such as New York City, LA, et cetera. Um, one of the things that it, it, it one of the things that seems interesting about the current scenario is that, and while not all of you illustrate this, um, even in today, your own chapters and locational breakdowns kind of illustrates this. It seems like there is an actual frustration and radicalization in smaller chapters, which makes up, you know, a slight bulk of the DSA ultimately. Um, is that a fair perception? Um, and how does that play out in regards to these formations, caucuses, slates, et cetera, 
Yeah, and I should be careful. I I couldn't remember if Groundwork was a Slate or a Caucus, just like uh, Marxist Unity Group used to be Marxist Unity Slate. Uh, I assume Groundwork will probably end up being a Caucus, but I could be wrong about that. So, uh, can any of you speak to that? Um, is that totally malfunctioning? <laughs> like, you're just like, oh, I have no idea what you, you threw this at us. But I, I do think it's something interesting to think about because I do associate, for example, socialist majority specifically with New York. Um, and one of the things to remember about the DSA in New York is the DSA in New York City has had a pretty significant local caucus going back into the 80s when we didn't even think about the DSA being important. Um, so how do you think that, you know, is that, an, is that an actually fair characterization of the shift of the DSA? Is it actually being represented here? You don't think, you think it's just an overgeneralization and we can't actually know that much. All are completely fair answers. I'm just giving you some beans. Well, it's tough to say. Um, you know, I can only kind of speak for my personal experience a little bit. You know, I joined DSA when I was living in Chicago, um, and Chicago's a very big city. Uh, the DSA chapter in Chicago is surely one of the larger ones um, in the United States. The East Bay DSA chapter that I'm in now is also, you know, one of the larger ones in the U.S. Um, to the extent to which size correlates to either kind of right or left, um, that's an interesting question. And as I'm mulling it over, I'm, I'm almost wondering if part of it would have to do with kind of what the DSA chapter sees as their particular goal in a certain way. I just have to imagine that being in Chicago presents the DSA in Chicago <laughs> with particular uh, projects, uh, particular goals that maybe smaller chapters wouldn't necessarily have. Um, you know, I met a lot of um, very interesting folks and, and very kind folks in Chicago uh, DSA. And when I was there, um, I was told, well, the reason that Mug um, hasn't been able to get many of the good uh, Marxists to join is because class unity scooped them all up. <laughs> so, yeah. um, yeah. you know, uh, what does that mean? I don't know. Um, it may not but, be in that organization. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I said it may or may not be in that organization. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, that that's, you know, that's what I was told in a certain sense. So that's what I got from Chicago. That's funny. Um, well, 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 class unity kind of made kind of made a big move to leave the DSA, and they recruited a lot of us who were who were DSA adjacent but not in when they left. So, um, uh, which is an interesting it, it's an interesting project and I think a lot about it because the class unity is basically taking the same attitude towards the DSA that the DSA is taking towards the Democratic Party at both inside outside strategy. Um, and uh, I will say one of the weirder things about class unity is it has quite a lot of members, but as of right now, it doesn't really have a whole lot of clear action points now that it's no longer just in the DSA, um, because uh, the a whole panoply of other problems immediately open up. How do you relate to the DSA now that you are both inside and outside of it, et cetera? And other caucuses that have tried that have had issues with it, like the Libertarian Socialist Caucus did the same thing, I think still does the same thing. Do they still exist? I don't even know. Um, so you know it, it one thing that it does seem to do however is hamper your ability to to affect the dsa as directly when you take such a stance and one of the dangers of that and i can say this uh as in the uh in an, in that uh formation um is that sometimes it becomes the uh the support group for people who felt burned by certain factions of the DSA. And 
Uh, I can tell you as a person who's never been in the DSA, I don't relate to that at all. And so it's sometimes somewhat frustrating to me. But I think I think that's an interesting thing. What caused them to leave uh, for people who who don't know, and I say them even though I'm a member because I wasn't a member then, uh, are to take the inside outside strategy was the response to AOC's vote on the railroad situation and the railroad strike in the way that was presented. Um, now, um, I think that is what led a lot of people to think that the DSA might actually take a more liquidation of stance um, was that particular event. And what is clear to me is actually it seemed to have galvanized things internally as well, although uh, I don't know over what. Like, for, 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 again, I, I don't speak to certain things, and I don't think I've ever admitted what political organization I'm in until right now. But um, uh, there you go. I also think we do have to deal with the fact that there are strong regional caucuses. Yeah, uh, class unity is really strong in Chicago. It's really strong in... Uh, it was really strong in Maryland, but the Maryland group actually sp split to stay fully within the DSA. It, it became, well, amongst other reasons, there's some other things that went on there too. I don't know all of it. Became the Winter Caucus, etc. One of the things I want to ask you though, um, about, you know, I mentioned earlier that, that these caucuses are hard to characterize because their goals, agendas, and orientations are like that hugely different. Um, so, for example, MUG is is diverse in belief, but united on program programmatism in a call for eventually uh, abolishing the Constitution and rewriting a new Constitution for a for a uh, democratic republic, one that would hopefully be more amenable to socialism, removing the anti-democratic elements of the Constitution out. What I find interesting about that is, in some ways, even the Jacobin faction of the DSA, you know which is, you know, a broad and nebulous thing. It's not one calcus or anything like that. Has been talking that way for many, many years, but when you when you make it explicit, they freak out. So they they called for abolishing the Senate or getting rid of the, the, um, the unaccountability of the judiciary, et cetera. Um, and they've made it like you could just reform yourself to that without completely rewriting the constitution, which has always just been like, why won't you say what you have to do to do that? Just, you know. Um, and the biggest pushback to you guys, and one of the reasons why I would say it's hard to characterize y'all's exact position on even my left-right spectrum is in some ways the demand to abolish and rewrite the constitution is one of the more radical demands out there. But I would not say by and large that Marxist unity group is like the most left-wing caucus in the DSA. I'd probably give that to the communist caucus, honestly. Um, uh, which I sometimes call viewpoint magazine caucus. But um, are the libertarian socialists are one of those kinds of formations. Um, so it is hard to like characterize you on this because in some ways, like a lot of groups would not admit that that's what the, you, you know, there's a lot of people that say things that if you think about it, strongly imply they'd have to dramatically rewrite the constitution or at least pass such a large series of amendments that you might as well have done so in the first place. Um, but I've always been confused by this from them because when the Jack Knights would say that, they'd also like, well, we need to do this so we could have a more democratically accountable Congress and thus achieve a socialist strategy. But then I'm like, yeah, but how do we have the ability to have the vote to propose constitutional amendments without already, like, that's just a circular problem in this. Um, so um how has the DSA responded? Uh, you mentioned the YDSA is is uh, is more sympathetic, and I could definitely see that actually. But one of the things that I, I have seen is the demand about the Constitution is where you guys get attacked the most. I suppose that's fair. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, um, we get it all sides. We get it from all sides uh, within the DSA and outside of the DSA. You know, there are people who say, you know, it's too radical. It's utopian. We're going to scare people off and we're not going to be able to get, you know, the numbers um, in terms of, you know, that we need just for, for organization. Um, and, you know, so it's spooky. The, the Constitution is spooky and we don't want to talk about it. And I think that's just because it's just, I don't know, kind of this like... I don't know. It's it's so fetishized in American politics. It is this kind of I don't know, this like sublime object that, you know, is supposed to guarantee freedom and democracy. And I think it's hard for people to like break from what almost amounts to brainwashing around the constitution, even when they are, you know, radicalized. I think that it also just maybe scares people a little bit due to the um climate um with regards to the imperial police state i think that you know people maybe worry about talking about the constitution directly um it's not illegal though so um no worries on that um but then yeah there are also you know people who are maybe more ultra left that just say like a new constitution like you know like you want a new republic like that's not that's not socialism um that's not liberatory um yeah. just in discussion of kind of like state form or state craft is also scary um so you know to some it's way too radical to some it's way too conservative the left cons on twitter do really hate you guys i mean like like particularly actually more than they hate like socialist majority and what yeah it's kind they of hate strange. Us a lot. Um, it, it, some good memes come out of it sometimes but yeah there's a lot of animosity which yeah. is too bad i think but um I wasn't going to bring that up because it amuses me as somebody who's moved between all these different worlds, how much people will hit, will hate on Marxist union group. And, and really let's be honest, part of that is just hating on Donald. Um, like if we're completely fair, like they don't know who most of you guys are. They've just been arguing with Donald for years. And if you know, Donald's deep lore a long time ago, he was in the IWW, et cetera. And I think he's been open about that. So uh, that's part of what that's about, but it is funny because I feel like you guys get way more shit than, um, other caucuses in the DSA who are objectively much further to the right. So, um, so, yeah, quick. go ahead. I'm sorry. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. Just very quickly, if I could kind of continue or linger a little longer on the DSA and the constitution and where things kind of stand on that. Um, I'm very excited that, um, or I should say I'm very hopeful uh, that NPEC will have an event in the near future talking about uh, what does democracy mean in the United States. Um, and I'm very hopeful that this will be a panel event where we can start to bring out a lot of these ideas. Um, talking with, you know, my fellow NPEC uh, mates who, um, you know, I consider valuable comrades and who I've learned a lot from, you know, going back and forth with. Um, you know, I think I've I've learned a little bit about how the DSA, well, I should be careful not to generalize a smaller group of folks into the entire DSA, but perhaps where some of the DSA kind of fits into the discussion of the Constitution. On the one hand, you know, you will meet folks in the DSA uh, who you talk about the Constitution and yeah, you know, who likes the Constitution? We need to change that thing. Um, for those folks, though, the, the difference is what is the primary um, what is the primary tactical uh, or the primary strategic uh, objective? Um, and often for those folks, it is not about, you know, centering a political critique uh, around the lack of democracy in the United States. But, you know, those folks will, you know, say, yeah, you know, the Constitution, who likes it? For other folks, um, there's um, a lack of interest, I think, for various reasons, in pointing to the DSA's political platform, which we talked about a little bit, which does call for a new, uh, for a, a constitutional convention uh, and does point to the DSA as, you know, no democracy at all uh, and does call for abolishing the Senate, does call for abolishing the Supreme Court. Now to your point, you know, talking about this kind of eclecticism right below or, you know, more or less right below that stanza talking about abolishing the Senate, are various bills, you know, that we should pass in order to do certain things. Um, 
So I'm hopeful that this discussion around, um, as it's going to be framed, actually, I was just talking about this with folks, how to frame these questions in kind of a neutral way. This question around what does the DSA mean when they say the US is no democracy at all, uh, that that will very much come up for discussion. And to Aaliyah's point, I have also encountered this sense of, well, now is uh, not the time. Uh, these are dangerous times. Um, we might not have something good, but there's always something worse. Uh, you know, folks will point to X, Y, and Z country. Folks will point to Donald Trump. Or, um, you know, I haven't called it this, but maybe I'll call it the specter of, of bourgeois democracy, the term bourgeois democracy, which I've come to particularly loathe. Um, that gets invoked pretty well. You know, this is some kind of democracy. Um, and therefore, this whole critique around democracy, you know, what's that kind of getting at? And I'm particularly interested in tracing that and bringing that out within the DSA. And I'll wrap up just by saying the discussion that we're having in MPEC around this is vibrant. And so that gives me hope uh, that, you know, this will this will catch on and, and really spark interest. I find it interesting just because I know amongst bourgeois historians, even it's pretty well understood that the U.S. federal Republican system is one of the least democratic of the uh, post-Enlightenment parliamentary, we're not parliamentary, but we're close, congressional democracies. Um, and that's not super controversial in, in like historiographic circles, but it is in you know, open political debate to actually admit it. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, fair enough. One of the things I think that we could talk about when it comes to accountability and responsibility is it seems like one of Mug's initial pushes, and it's one that I actually support from the outside, is to make DSA more transparent and accountable to its membership because that's actually been trending in the other direction the past three or four years. Um, so can uh, you guys talk about your, your initiatives on that and how that's going and, and uh, where there might be opposition to that? I'll start off very briefly just by saying that I see the um, initiative to expand Democratic Left, which is the newspaper or the information source of DSA. I see that as an important part of developing more internal democracy. Um, and that was, uh, I hesitate to say, almost unanimously supported by folks. Um, that's not to say that um, you know, these aren't kind of contentious issues. Um, but I do see the potential expansion of a literary organ, a literary tool, uh, something that seeks to both develop folks' ability to express themselves. You know, certainly I'm trying to do that, learn how to write things and communicate my ideas. Um, and then also perhaps brings folks off of, uh, you know, smaller social media platforms. Um, I stay away from that, but I hear that, you know, that's where a lot of uh, critique kind of takes place. Um, I'm hopeful that we could continue to see the development of uh, stronger, larger, more vibrant uh, kind of communicative mechanisms within, within the DSA. Uh, let's see, can I speak to the DSA democracy? I think, um, I think the most important thing for me is that the DSA allows caucuses. I find that very important to the, the internal democratic process. And so in terms of empowering membership, like I think it's true that there is a framing of like leadership membership. That's, that's a perspective that you could take that would be based in reality, I think. But I think the structures are already there to, to, to advocate for membership. And that's the open debate. 
and the ability to litigate um, political differences in the form of caucuses. So I feel like um, I don't think any other left organization has that character to it. And so, unless I'm mistaken, right? I mean, the PSL or the CPA, there's a, they all have faction bands. And the only for me, one that's that just... does not is uh, CPUSA, which I was in back in the day, but I think it's, its vibrant tendencies have kind of died down over the past decade. So, it but in, doesn't in general, have faction yes. bands? It has a democratic centralist band, which is another problem, but then so does technically the DSA, but not everyone ignores it. So, you know, like, um, uh, do you, have they formally removed a democratic centralist band yet? No. Okay. I mean, what, like, be, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that is technically a rule is that um, one of the only rules against forming a faction within the DSA is that factions that, um, advocate for or are organized around democratic centralism are not technically allowed, um, but I, it is not enforced. Um, I consider, and it, yeah, that uh, shouldn't ahead. be the case either. <laughs> it's a big problem, but um, I consider it a Shackmanite Harringtonite left vestige of the origins of the organization, and it was also in the S, uh, the SPUSA, which I was a member of way back in the day, like way way back in the day. Or well, I was a fellow traveler of my. Uh, there was not a caucus in my area when our uh, a chapter in my area when I was actually work uh, working with them. Um, but in general, you're you're correct, T Tony. That m almost all the almost all the existing sectarian organizations um, model themselves on the post 1921 uh, Bolshevik Party Constitution, which contains the faction ban. Um, and for me, and I'm just speaking for me here. Uh, but I happen to know that some people at Cosmonaut Magazine agree with me on this. That is one of the original sins of left organization was the faction ban, the caucus ban, or whatever, because it necessitates splitting. It uh, makes things that can be compromised on legitimately within, within socialists for a, for a viable program where we can compromise impossible and encourages... Um, purgings, et cetera. Um, and in fact, uh, I really love the Bolshevik 1918 program and the, and the proto faction ban on the 21 points attached to that is why I can't endorse it. So, uh, I'll, Leah, you may speak. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I just think that, um, you know, we were talking about Mike McNair earlier. Um, he has kind of that banger quote in Revolutionary Strategy, and I can just read it real quick. It says, um, to retain its character as an effective instrument of the proletariat as a class, a workers' organization must have freedom to organize factions within its ranks. Indeed, the struggle of trends, platforms, and factions is a normal and essential means by which its differences are collectivized and unity created out of them. It must be unity and diversity. And I think that that is one of our core strategic reasons for organizing within the DSA is there is the ability to form factions and to have these debates and hash them out together. That is an important and necessary part of a healthy party. And if we want to build a healthy party, we need to start on good ground. Um, and that for me is why I feel D very strongly, honestly, that the DSA is the vehicle for building our party. And I don't really know that any other sort of vehicle or apparatus is, you know, going to be able to execute that, which is a huge task. Um, and I, I, I don't see the point, you know, people say, oh, why not this org? Why not this org? Like, you know, we got to look at the framework of the organization. And I think the DSA is just, you know, it's it's kind of the bare bones, but, you know, it's better than building on like what amounts to be a crumbling foundation. And I think that, you know, if we were trying to do this work within any of the other established organizations, at least, um, you know, it would are, it would be a non-start. 
Um, and then obviously, you know, when you consider the DSA's existing membership and infrastructure, we're certainly in a better place than if we were starting from scratch. <laughs> so it just seems like, you know, it is strategically the place to be as far as I'm concerned. Although not to, um, not to derail too much, I am curious what you think Class Unity offers, you know, as a vehicle that the DSA does not, because of course, you know, you know, we don't really say, I mean, of course, you know, we're running, we just started a new uh, onboarding cycle. So, you know, there was a bit of join mug, join mug. But for the most part, what we really uh, advocate for is join DSA, find the faction you really like, you know, find your place within the DSA, start organizing within the DSA, because this is the place to be. Um, and so I wonder what you feel Class Unity offers that DSA does not. Um. So on the spectrum of, of, uh, of left positions, I actually am a hardline United Front non-collaborationist. Um, and while I'm willing to work with the DSA, I'm not willing to work with the people the DSA is willing to work with. Um, so the, the inside outside caucus thing there was actually quite interesting. The, the problem that I'd have with the prior attempt to do this in liberta libertarian socialist caucus is I just, I'm not an anarchist, like at least not in that sense. And so uh, it it presents its own problems. Now I can I can talk about this in terms of, of uh, the, I definitely see the problems of all these orientations. Um, I will be very direct in what I think uh, would need to happen uh, for the DSA uh, to be more viable to me. If it is going to have any allegiance with the, with the Democratic Party, there has to be a program. Without a program, you cannot hold anyone accountable. You cannot build the mechanism to hold anyone accountable. And so at that point, you're basically a special interest group for the within the Democratic Party. Um, that is something that I did definitely say there are factions. There are more than one faction in the DSA, actually, that would in would more or less agree with me about the long term need for that. Um, they would not, they would, some of them probably don't take as hard of a line as you in regards to the constitution are some of them. Uh, I mean, I know some of them, some of them are even more, you know, are more electoral skeptical than I am. Uh, I think again, of the communist caucus. Um, but it seems to me that that's the, the primary issue. However, I, you know, one of the things I can, I can tell you about, uh, even an organization like Class Unity is the opinion within that organization about anything is pretty huge, including what it even is um, now that it is no longer in the DSA. Um, so who knows where any of this is going to go? Um, the other thing I will say is that I mentioned that the only other organization that has factions is the SPUSA, uh, which is your opposed sister organization in the history of things when the spa splits uh in the 60s the sp the sp um usa is the party faction that separates off um they consider harrington to concessionists that leads to Harrington forming the Social Democrat. I forget the exact name, which is eventually one of the one of the groups that merges with another group to form the DSA in '82. Um, so it's actually interesting that the one group that I would mention that would also have these conditions. It's kind of faded into its own sectarianism and and whatnot in the past decade, but it also has the same origins issue. And that, and what that really goes back to is it does have a lineage directly to the SPA. And, and that is actually something that I think even the DSA sometimes forgets that it has a lineage going back to Debs directly. Um, uh, I don't love the family tree that brought it into being, but nonetheless it does. Um, 
I don't want to so, interrupt you, but I think that that is like important to point out. It's so important. We feel that we have the 1912 party program of the SPA in our reader. Um, you know, I mean, we look at a variety of programs in that section, but that is part of it. And I do think that that is, um, I think even just the history of programmatic politics in America, you know, albeit sparse, should be looked at and isn't being looked at. Um, can I clarify that the reader that Aliyah is talking about is the onboarding reading group, the requirement for membership? Right. It's Sorry. Not the, our it's not the blue book. Which no, is not, our not flashy. Our <laughs> it's our yeah. flashy alternative to the red book, the little red book, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no. In a, in a week three, um, during our like reading group onboarding cycle, we talk about um, the classical Marxist minimum maximum program. And that's actually the last program that we look at. We also look at, um, we look at lessons of air fort from Mike McNair. Um, we look at the party ouvrier program. We, um, look at the critique of the air fort program from Engels. Um, we look at the actual program and then we look at, uh, Liebknecht's speech to the air fort Congress. So, um, yeah, but anyway. I didn't mean to derail you. I just but wanted you don't to... make them read the Ooh. class struggle and the road to power, do you? Because you should, but um, not not that I should tell you how to build your your educational group. But <laughs> if I can just add in real quick, just to linger on you know the party program and the SPUSA, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know one of the things we emphasize, not to belabor the point, but one of the things that we emphasize in that 1912 program is what the SB, uh, excuse me, I keep saying SBUSA, is what the SBA says in regards to the presidency, the constitution, the Supreme Court, the Senate. Um, reading that for the first time when I was going through the reader, it kind of blew my mind because this wasn't things that I thought socialists talk about. Um, I had been, you know, kind of first interested in the Socialist Equality Party. And then, you know, I was in the ISO and, you know, so I'd been around some left stuff. Um, but socialists didn't talk about the Senate. You know, socialists don't talk about the Constitution. Uh, every socialist knows that politics is bad. The state is bad. Um, and that's the radical position to take. That's the thing you need to know. Uh, you need to know kind of what to call bad and what to call good. Um, so that program and, you know, I don't know what good it is necessarily in terms of having a conversation with someone, but perhaps then tracing the DSA back to Debs in some regards. And Debs wasn't always, uh, you know, an opponent of the Constitution that developed over time, um, but it did, you know, occur at, at one spot. Um, and then I just have to, you know, continue to plug perhaps, you know, things that, that Mug comrades have, have written and published on Cosmonaut. Um, one of the projects I think that's exciting is our back and forth with CPUSA, if I can call it that. You know, folks have published uh, things in Cosmonaut, uh, MUG members, including myself, Myra, you know, have published responses. Um, and the CPUSA is interesting because they use phrases like, you know, um, you know, achieve democracy, winning the battle for democracy, um, radical reconstruction. Uh, you know, we just got a letter from a CPUSA member who said, um, you know, it's a good thing that they've switched away from, um, you know, their previous position and now they're reading uh, Du Bois and, and Radical Reconstruction. Um, so it's interesting to, the, the CPUSA is in some ways, at least for me, kind of an interesting foil in a way, um, because in some ways they speak our language to some extent. They use terms uh, that we use. Um, and yet at the end of the day, when you get down to it, there are real differences in terms of uh, the extent to which they imagine a break with the constitution, but even very interestingly enough, what they imagine um, the future socialist state to be like, um, you know, and I'll just end by saying, I read a very interesting article by someone who um, went very far in imagining what the revolutionary state would be. Um, and it included a, a bicameral legislative system, which I thought was very interesting. Um, you know, we harp a lot on unicameral <laughs> legislative system. So that, of course, you know, that stuff really rocks my boat. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very interesting discussion. I'm not going to make fun of you for being a Norfite at any time in your life, I promise. Um, uh, 
uh, I actually, you do have something in the blue book, I believe, correct? Um, am I wrong about that? I thought I saw your name. Uh, I, I do have an article in uh, the blue book. It's an interesting one to look back on. Um, I actually wrote it for the platypus um, convention. Um, I was asked to give a talk on Marxism and um, radical republicanism. And so that article is the talk that I gave. Um, if I would do it over again, I would actually write it differently. I've been thinking about writing a little um, response to it because there are things that I've changed my mind on and, and that I think are reflected in, in other things I've written recently for Cosmonaut. Um, but it's a really important part of, of Mug. I think it's the important part. And don't forget to mention to your collaborative piece with our comrade Myra that is specifically addressing, you know, the CPUSA as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Aaliyah. Yeah. yeah. The CPUSA is quite interesting to me in that it was dormant from say, I mean, I know I'm gonna get pushback from my listeners who are in the CPUSA, but it was really kind of stagnant between the 80s to, I don't know, five years ago. Um, and there have been some pretty significant changes in its orientation, uh, some softening on its popular front stance in regards to the Democratic Party and which factions of the Democratic Party it thought were worth supporting, et cetera, uh, rebirth of its labor policy. They were, the CPUSA has been instrumental in labor campaigns, uh, particularly Amazon United. Uh, so um, that's been interesting to me, but I also do think its understanding of a lot of these issues does come out of positions that it maintained after 1936, um, and I don't love them. Um, uh, all that said, you know, if you're going to trace your history in the United States to the socialism, you have to deal with like um, the, you know, the CPUSA and the SPA are the two largest socialist movements in the American history period in the discussion by a lot. And then, um, uh, although in, in raw numbers, the CPUSA's highest membership is about where the DSA is now, and that was in 1948. Um, so something to think about. Um, so I, I do find that illustrative. Um, if I was to plug something I've done, which I don't normally do on these shows, but I actually have done a breakdown of the various introductory reading programs of all the, the caucuses that have made their reading programs publish, including yours. Um, and I had some good things to say about yours, although I did notice the particular orientation that it had, uh, so which was mostly programmatic. Um, uh, you, you might find it interesting, Luke, in particular, that when I was in the Reb Party uh, way back uh, in 2015, um, I cataloged 150 programs and platforms of different socialist parties and coordinated them um, over the over the various years and like tried to classify them about how they fell into the min max program. What was their interpretation? Trying to figure out how different people interpreted the transitional program, et cetera, uh, was all uh, what I've done. And I've spoken to DSA caucuses about that research, even though it wasn't for them. Um, and I really do appreciate uh, sincerely that you guys have picked that up. Um, uh, and um, because it needs to be it needs to be discussed. It was not all just like state good, state bad um, as your primary locus of socialist organizing discussion. I mean, yes, ultimately, all socialists eventually want to like turn the, the state into the administration of things. But like in the immediate run, almost nobody thinks you can do that uh, except for. I don't even really believe a lot of anarchists think you can do that immediately, honestly. I know they tell me they believe that, and maybe I should take them at their word charitably, but when they describe what they want to do, I actually don't believe them. That they. But anyway, uh, I know too many anarchists who are into modern monetary theory, and I just don't... I uh, They can't dismantle the state and do that. Um, so, as a side note, that, that that's neither here nor there and isn't relevant to you. It just occurred to me as I was speaking. Um... But 
I do think one of the things I've wanted to give uh, both Cosmonaut Magazine and um, uh, Marx and Unity Group some props for is revising the study of, of the actual structures of both the American socialist movement and of actually existing socialist states in a way that is both critical but not as immersed in anti-communist propaganda, which is kind of a problem when you read left oppositionist work. And by left oppositionist, we mean Trotskyist, just so people know, um, uh, which has been decontextualized a lot of the time in academic frameworks that were acceptable to anti-communist discourse. So you could talk about certain kinds of Trotskyism um, et cetera. So there, there's a reason, for example, that like more Trotskyist literature is from the third campus view than say the defensist view that's out and available to the public. Um, which is not to say that it was ever like a, like a conspiracy. It's not that it's just, you, you think about how peer review works. That's how it happened. Um, one of the things that I used to accuse Cosmonaut of being before there was a Marxist unity group. And so I haven't accused you guys of this. Uh, and so I'm going to throw this out as the most incendiary thing I'm going to say to you before. So this will be my final question. How are you not Trotskyism by other means? Well, for one, I think you already delineated, um, you know, the, the distinction between a minimum maximum mm -hmm. uh, program and function and outlook as opposed to a transitional program i think that like that by and large is like probably the biggest thing um oh can i also a... say trots mm -hmm. sell their newspapers and mug gives away the newspapers for free ah, that's, that's the that. difference <laughs> 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 that actually is, I think, one of the main reasons I really wanted uh, Tony to come on here. I think that our biggest win at convention was our um, our bulletin proliferation scheme, as people on Twitter were calling it, our newspaper sweatshop. <laughs> um, and I was hoping Tony would have an opportunity to talk about that endeavor, as well as with Luke. Um, but I didn't mean to interrupt, please. I think, um, yeah, running like a newspaper scheme at convention is um, just, I guess, dangerously close to full on trot, right? <laughs> I, there's no, there's no denying that. <laughs> uh, and and it's also true that we have many former trots in our ranks. So, like, the thing that you're perceiving is probably that. But I also think that, yeah, the, there's important strategic differences. Like, Aaliyah gave the serious answer about, about the, the, the future of the DSA and what, what a Marxist would want and what a, I guess Trots call themselves Marxists too, um, but a Trot would want. <laughs> yeah, I think to go back just very briefly to a point you were making, Derek, about perhaps how we bring in some texts or some curriculum that might be used in kind of a, I don't know, a Cold War, uh, you know, anti-communist lens, um, but we look at it from a different viewpoint, so to speak. Um, the one I can think of that kind of best encapsulates that, it's not something that's in our um, reader, in our introductory texts, um, but it's something I've drawn on a fair bit and, you know, originally was encouraged to look at it from other folks was um, Rosa Luxemburg's critique of um, Lenin and Trotsky in regards to democracy. Um, and that's in, you know, her book on the Russian revolution. I got a copy of that from Amazon. Um, and, you know, maybe I should have known, you know, it has a, um, a preface by uh, uh, Bertrand Wolf. Um, who kind of frames, you know, the text as, you know, the liberatory Luxembourg, you know, versus the the despot Lenin, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and um, 
what she says in terms of, you know, making a virtue out of um, necessity um, and dragging democracy, uh, you know, in a particular context for a particular reason. She understands the context, um, but she calls them out on that point, um, not making virtues out of um, necessity, seeing things in their uh, particular context and in their historical context. And then I'll tie that into um, how we're not trots by, um, and actually I shouldn't say, well, how we're not Trotskyists, you know, by another name. Um, one thing I've noticed, um, and this isn't unique to Trotskyism or to the education that you'd get in a Trotskyist group, um, but there are historical gaps. Uh, there are periods in history that just didn't happen. Uh, you just wouldn't learn about them. Um, and that's, again, not unique to Trotskyist groups, um, but we really push back about, uh, you know, against that. I think that's why folks call Mug Kautskyist, uh, if folks do still, I, I don't know. Again, like I said, I try and stay off Twitter. <laughs> but um, because we read second international texts, I think, um, and that that kind of brings in a, a certain picture. Um, but from what I've noticed and kind of my back and forth with folks who, you know, are of more of a Trotskyist persuasion, um, there's a certain uh, gravitation towards and then holding on to particular moments in time. Uh, so the Soviets in 1917, um, the Russian Revolution as something that fundamentally changed how Marx, Orthodox Marxists, uh, so on and so forth, had thought of democracy and the democratic state, you know, a transcendence of, you know, the demand for a democratic republic or so on and so forth. Um, and that one doesn't really learn a lot about Lenin, uh, the Democrat. Um, you know, as someone else said to me, you know, the greatest revolutionary in history is also a Democrat. Um, you wouldn't learn that uh, through your typical Trotskyist education. I think you'd learn about you know, the Vanguard Party and so on and so forth. We read Lars Lee, you know, uh, in our reader. The other thing I'll say, um, just because I found it kind of funny, um, you know, in the ISO, um, we didn't read too many texts on by Hal Draper, um, but when things were kind of falling apart, um, someone started passing around, uh, you know, Anatomy of a Microsect by Hal Draper. Um, we didn't read, <laughs> you know, Hal Draper's uh, myth of, of Lenin and the, and the Vanguard Party, um, which is a text that I think we draw on uh, and is very important. Uh, so those are, are some of the many ways I think that, that we're different. Yeah, I think that in terms of Kautsky, I think like most of our group members feel that there's nothing we're taking from Kautsky that you're not finding in Marxism, in the works of like Marx and Engels. Um, if anything, maybe, you know, further kind of deliberation on some of the finer points that, you know, Marx and Engels don't get into. Um, we feel it's there. And I do think, yeah, the distinction um, in terms of organization and like sort of achieving class consciousness out of false consciousness, I think that there is a really, really, really just fundamental break between like the vanguardist outlook and then the merger formula, which we use. Um, and I think that that's, you know, really crucial as well. Um, I think that the merger formula isn't honestly, and it should have been, but it's not something that I really was thinking about or heard talked about by other communists that I knew. And it wasn't until sort of starting to ingratiate um, myself into like the mug orbit just first with like making friends with some of the members and then later as i applied you know i hadn't really heard about the merger formula as much as i should have it wasn't a part of um any of the education that i was able to find out there for myself and i think i was a little you know limited just by my own location and position in terms of what kind of education i could get you know i again i had to go to the internet for a lot of it but um yeah that was really new and crucial. I don't know if that answers really your question, but um, I think that, you know, Luke talked about uh, like Lenin and this vanguardism. And I think that that is somewhere we break really harshly 
from. And I think that that's good. I think that that's a strength of our um, approach to organization. I was just being a jerk. I used to tell that to, to Donald, uh, that if he wasn't careful, he was just going to read the Trotskyism. Um, uh, but uh, so, so thank you for taking my, my asinine question seriously. Um, so uh, I'm about to let you guys uh, do plugs and talk about your programs. And I want to also point out that um, you will probably be seeing a lot more cooperation with this channel uh with um both factions within the dsa and outside of it um and most especially cosmonaut mug which isn't quite the same thing but you can't really totally separate them either so um uh in fact this week this comes out there will be uh right after it a cosmonaut interview on the relevance of the history of the soviet union so you know but you'll see a lot more of this in fact you guys don't know this, but I am doing commentary on several of your articles for my patrons. And since you guys are nice, I will send it to you and you can listen to it and respond. Um, but uh, so so, you know, I'm, I am taking Marxist unity group seriously. If nothing else, I've I've been arguing with cosmonaut members in some way, form or fashion for over a decade. So um, it's. It is something that I intend on doing. Um, I also wish you luck on uh, on your campaign for the DSA. I am rooting for you because, frankly, um, I don't see that many other groups with any access to the to the DSA National that I would take particularly seriously. There are other groups that I do like in the DSA. Um, I don't know much about Red Star. I, while I slag on the Communist Caucus, I actually deeply respect them, and particularly what they've done in LA. Um, and I like people in Class Unity, obviously, but also in the Winter Caucus and in um, uh, uh, elements of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus, even though, as a side note, why the earth would anyone call themselves that? Um, but uh, regardless, uh, I think you'll see a lot more co co cooperation because the factions that I like in the DSA are slightly more ascendant than the ones that I don't. And that's a nice change. Um, uh, I'm still... Not that I'm going to ask you to slag on your comrades, but but the the ticket's still out on bread and roses i'm watching them i'm making decisions but uh but everybody else i kind of know where i stand on and so i want to thank you guys for coming on and plug your stuff it's so weird on a communist podcast to ask people to plug stuff and i never get used to it but you need to so plug um i'll start as um a part of you know the editorial board at cosmonaut obviously like read cosmonaut and further than that you know read our book read our articles and respond if you don't like something you see i mean we publish a lot of stuff recently people were up in arms like crazy about this uh article we published that was um kind of against dialectical logic and i <laughs> was one of them you know so we publish all kinds of stuff and we want to hear what you think so you know read our stuff and then you know deliberate email us write us letters write us articles just get engaged because if you're a communist or a socialist in this country um we need to be hashing out these ideas and not just on Twitter dunking on each other posting memes but like really engaging in productive political deliberation so read cosmonaut listen to cosmopod um and please like join DSA you know i respect to class unity people i there are some people out there that i dearly you know respect and admire that are a part of class unity and i'm not going to crap on that but i would say like please join dsa if you have issues with the dsa come come into the dsa and hash them out work with us in changing the character of the dsa and building a mass party because you know wherever you stand i know not everybody is down with partyism but i do think that it is 
the Marxist approach and it is also our only real shot. We need numbers and we need to organize together um, and we need to collectivize unity and diversity. No splitting. Um, it's so important that we learn to work together um, through our differences, um, not in spite of our differences. Uh, that's all I have to say. Yeah, well, first off, thanks, Derek, for having us on. Um, I've listened to your podcast for a long time, you know, prior to when I was uh, in MUG or even in the ISO. So, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from you and, and I appreciate, uh, you know, you sharing that with us. Um, I echo what Aliyah has said. Um, I encourage folks to reach out. Um, MarxistUnity at gmail.com uh, is our email address. Uh, we check the email pretty frequently. And I would also encourage folks to read Cosmonaut, um, but particularly Cosmonaut um, takes uh, articles, obviously, so consider writing for Cosmonaut. They also take letters though. Um, honest to goodness, I've learned so much from folks. It's very hard. <laughs> I'm learning how to not feel yucky when people critique my stuff, um, but I've learned that's how I learn. Um, and it's through people writing a, a letter or response to something that I've written that then triggers a response, then triggers a response uh, that brings out, uh, I think, very substantial and informative dialogue. Um, so I really encourage folks to engage with uh, Cosmonaut Magazine uh, in that way. Um, and if you, you know, and if you do that, I, I, I think it would be well worth your while. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, I would like to plug my DSA chapter. Uh, if you're listening from Central Jersey, please join our chapter. Find us at um, central.dsanj.org uh, or just follow us on Insta or uh, Twitter or whatever. And the other thing I can plug is the bulletin. Look how pretty they are. You can find our convention bulletins on our website. They're really substantive and they react to the news of the convention. And this is, yeah, we, we touched on it. Um, and it's way better than the Democratic left is right now. <laughs> but once the Democratic left becomes, like Luke mentioned, the plans to grow the Democratic left, and then I future plug once the Democratic left is as substantive as our uh, convention bulletins. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and as, I, I, go ahead, Elliot. Is that okay? Sorry, as yeah, one totally. final thing, because it's important to mention, I because of just our numbers in terms of population, I feel like I pretty much know my left-leaning comrades here in South Dakota, but on the off chance, you are not a person I know and have been pestering about this incessantly. You are listening from South Dakota and you want to get involved in actual organization and political work, please contact Sioux Empire DSA and join our organizing committee, help us build a chapter in the heart of the Midwest. We, this state needs it. Um, thank you. <laughs> And I'd also be remiss if I said, you know, don't check out the East Bay DSA. So please do check out East Bay DSA. Um, that's where I'm located. A good group of folks. So look forward to seeing you. I was about to slag on the Democratic left uh, thing. Well, one thing I, I will I will say that you guys have all brought up in your in your cloisters is I have to say that DSA up in its uh, revival since 2012 has over relied on private magazines, um, Jacobin, current, uh, current affairs, etc. And so and I think it's because that it hasn't invested enough in its own internal documents and magazines, uh, the Democratic left being the biggest one. Um, I have an issue of it was given to me somewhere and it's like three pages and well, we're just not going to talk about it. But um, but yeah. So I, I would tell you guys check that out. Check out uh, Marxist Unity Group uh, uh, website. It'll be in the show notes. Check out Cosmonaut Magazine. Um, follow what's going on in the DSA. 
um, if you're a member and you don't know what's going on in the DSA, and there are many, I, there are many people who are like, Varn, why do you know so much about DSA? I don't know, and I'm a member. And I'm like, well, what are you saying about yourself that I know more about your organization than you do? Um, so if you're in the DSA, uh, make it a better organization. That's that's my uh, that's my that's my challenge to those of you who are in it. Uh, and if you're not into the DSA, I'm not gonna tell you not to join. Um, and in fact, um, right now, I would even say maybe consider it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna like tell you guys that that's the most you're gonna get from me. But you got it. So uh, on that note, we're gonna end and have a great day. Thank <music> you.